Hi, everyone. We are live and the attendees are trickling in. Welcome to our eighth week of Lunch with Lunsford. Yeah, wild. For a solid two months. And today we are joined by the incredible Ifoma Fafunwa. Thank you so much for dialing in with us. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. We're really excited to have you. <laughs> good. Um, yeah. Sarah, but we do have um, a special treat for our Lunch with Lunsford audience, right? We do. We do. So uh, those of you who have been tuning in over the past few weeks or months know that we have been harping on the fact that we entirely lack a theme song. And we're so fortunate that Alex Giorgetti, who's the sound supervisor at Oberon, our second stage, very generously created this fantastic theme song for us that I'm going to play for you all now. I apologize if the sound levels are a little high, so maybe be prepared to, to turn it down if needed, but let's, uh, let's listen and groove. Oh, I want to hear your feedback. <laughs> this is great. If only you like it. I like a late night TV. That's, I, I said old school game show retro vibes and he nailed it. So again, thank you so much, Alex. And thank you all for tuning in to Lunch with Lunsford. All right. Wow, that was incredible. So this is, this is about the time where I disappear and let the Mark take the conversation over. So I'm going to hand it over to you two, my friends. I appreciate you both being here. I appreciate all of you watching, and I will see you next week for another Lunch with Lunsford. Bye, Sarah. Bye. Hi, Mark. Hi, Apoma. How are you? We've, um, we've, we've gone international, <laughs> which is really exciting. I'm, I'm so grateful that um, Apoma is with us. Um, for those of you who uh, are not familiar, Afoma is the writer creator of Hear Word, where I'm sporting the T-shirt today, <laughs> um, and uh, I I'm so thrilled that you've joined us, Afoma, so we can talk about talk about Hear Word. Not only its time at ART, but all of its iterations. Yes, I'm realizing that I'm having some slight technical difficulties but I am so if I come in and out it's because our power is fluctuating a little bit right now but okay. no problem we're gonna make it work yeah it's great it's also like okay. we're, we're all in this uncharted zoom territory together so I was on a call today where someone was like look my kid might show up my internet might go out you might see my cat <laughs> we all just need to be like you know, laid back about it, which I think everyone is is uh, willing to do. Um, so, Ifoma, um, I think it's it's really great today to like spend this hour on Hear Word because there is so much to talk about with this piece, um, and ART is just a part of what um, sort of the history of Hear Word um, is. And so, it's probably best to start it out. Um, just if you could give us like the, you know, the, the sort of elevator speech about your word, sort of the intro to what the piece is and kind of a little brief summary of the tour and, and all the places that it's played. We'll get into that in a lot more detail a little later, but that might help set the stage for folks. Yeah. All right, Mark. Um, yes. You, you wanted to know sort of how this began. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of the, your conception for the piece and um, and a little bit about all the places that it's played because it's been all over the world. Yes. Um, the idea, well, what happened was by chance, I was, um, I was asked to direct um, the vagina monologues in Lagos, which um, an, uh, an NGO called uh, the Kudirat Initiative for Democracy was bravely putting on at that time. This is, Oh, 15 years ago. And, um, but I had already in my mind um, began to conceive of work that had women's voices, African women's voices. And so, in fact, Joker Silva was producing it at the time. Joker Silva is one of the actresses in Hear Word. Yes. And she said, you know, you're the one to do it. So that, that together with my having seen um, early on uh, For Colored Girls, Ah, yeah. And um, somehow that just stuck with me. 
uh, and I wanted to 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 make something African, make something Nigerian from that. Now, um, the Kudirat Initiative, Initiative for Democracy was putting on vagina monologues, and then they create they wanted to create the Nigerian version uh, immediately after that. So it's sort of segue, but I had been grappling with my own story as well as, well, to be honest, I was looking at everyone else's story, not realizing that my story was was a part. And that might have been why I was yeah. everyone else. Yeah. Um, and I think, um, you know, so for folks who don't know it, it is, um, Hear Word is this, this piece where it's kind of a verbatim piece, right? Like you've interviewed so many women and then taken those stories and sort of written these composite characters that um, I think, if I remember right, some of the stories are like a direct account of someone's experience. Some of them are, you know, 10 women who've had a similar experience and you've written a character sort of based on the similarities in those stories. Um, so yes. the, yeah. Yeah, so, so basically some, some NGOs like uh, Project ACT, they were, there are some NGOs here that do women's work and had already begun to collect, you know, stories. So it's not like I had to, from the very beginning, go out. But of course, I was listening to stories um, of women who were friends of mine in my peer group and, and just seeing how patriarchy was manifesting itself on very different levels. Um, some organizations had stories from villages, for instance. I didn't go to a village to do that. Um, what, I, what I did was collect those stories and then add my stories and then begin to find out more. So it evolved. And, and here where it still changes as it goes along, Mark. I mean, sometimes it's yeah. um, shorter and sometimes it's longer. And sometimes pieces that are current news fit in um, sometimes we, we, we alter to deal with an issue that's on ground right now. So, so it really depends. But for me with friends, um, I found that, um, the people were, um, that people were, were limited. They were limited by what they were choosing to do and how they were choosing to participate and contribute to nation building. I think that gives a really good sense of a lot of things we want to talk about um, with how the show is made. But I'm also just struck by those women because those are like the leading actresses of Nigeria in that piece. I, I wonder like how you came to assemble such a powerhouse cast of, of women. Well, um, the, the idea originally, Mark, was to have um, very established, powerful celebrity actresses work with non-celebrity actresses and to see if then the non-celebrity actresses would, um, careers would explode, you know what I mean? And so yeah. it's kind of, they're helping others. And I think I each of these actresses, yeah, each of these actresses believe in the cause. They also believe in stage performance. And, um, and then they, you know, hear what has this, it's very emotional. So it's, it's sort of like a, like a boot camp for yeah. actors. So, so after the first show, then we got more celebrity actors saying, I want to be a part of this, um, et cetera. So, so there is, in fact, more interest in forming more groups with celebrity actresses that would do this work. I, I love how you talk about that too, in terms of like lifting up other women within the cast. And it occurs to me that like doing this show for these actresses is a lot of emotional labor, right? They're telling some really difficult stories and they're kind of stepping into that as many as eight times a week. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about, you know, what's, what's always been so beautiful to me is the, the culture of the cast and how they take care of one another. And in particular, the young women taking care of the uh, older women in the cast. And, and I wonder if you can just talk about sort of that care that everyone takes of each other. Um, I think we've been lucky. It's here. It's been going for six years now, and um, the cast has become a family. Uh, they will step in for one another, and we formed other groups. So there's a pigeon group, and they are family as well. And there's another group, and they are family as well. And so, um, I think it's the kind of work when you when you do this type of emotional work that's that's based on true life experiences. 
it people are raw because you're doing work and maybe another actor has experienced what someone else is doing is 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 expressing on stage mm. also i think we just set a culture of support i mean the world is already tough enough and you know we live you know like everyone else in a very patriarchal society so there's a lot of strain and stress on women to be perfect to have children to be married to be you know there's just a lot of the heavy lifting and burden is placed on women in 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 Africa and so you 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 have to find a safe place and that's what we decided to do as a group yeah i um so the the elements of the show that I have always like really struck me are, are um, uh, obviously the stories, but then also the way that the drumming and the music factors into the storytelling. And then also the way that you use, you use color, um, both in the lights and in the costumes. And so I wonder if you can talk a little bit about first, just like your physical aesthetic for the piece, like it, scenic wise, it's very simple, but there are so many other dynamic design elements happening. You can talk a little bit about sort of what motivated that for you or, or what, how you saw the piece um, physically that way? Um, I always imagine the piece very colorful and, and sexy because I was particular to create a type of work that was feminist, um, but you know, I didn't have that like, you know, not to say that I didn't agree with that. I just thought there wasn't enough work out there that had like what I had seen in Color Purple, mm. which is kind of the movement and the sensuality. Um, African women are strong, you know, dynamic. Um, we dress in a colorful way, you know, there's, so I thought all that was kind of missing and I was particular to put in the color of the fabric, the environment, the busyness, the sexiness of it. I also wanted to, add to the body of work that was kind of more angst filled. So if you notice there's movement and dance and, um, and jokes and humor and, you know, so, so that was it. That was it for me. Then of course I didn't want a, a set because I always imagined the work would move around Africa. Um, I didn't think that we would get to, you know, the ART <laughs> so soon, but I didn't want, I didn't want anything more than two suitcases of costumes and props, two, three suitcases, and we could move. So the only prop we have is the stool on stage um, yeah, and a fan. Yeah. So, so, so basically, because I have an architectural background as well, I was already thinking about light shaping space. You know, how do you create a room that's, that has no walls with light? How do you create a mood of being in a, in a forest or being, yeah, that's, that was already in my mind. And I also use the music to do the same thing. The drumming. Yeah. yeah, I mean the, the drummers too. <laughs> what like the shorthand that you have with those guys, I, I could say this for everyone watching that I've experienced in tech where you guys you're just like, no, it's that like that 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 part. And they're like, Oh yeah, we got you, Mrs. F <laughs> there. I was like, wow. <laughs> That's you know. they they've been there from the beginning. And the yeah. type of work where we the type of way we use drumming. I don't think they had done it before or it had existed before because not really song. It's sort of like sound effects, like in a film. Um, so the whole heartbeat and that type of thing. So yes, the the only way I could do it, I don't have a musical background. So it's to just like, you know, and they're like, okay. And they start, you know, so they, we have a language cause I, I can't explain it in words. <laughs> yeah. It in sounds. Um, and I think it also, uh, it lends itself so well, right? Because it both has such a strong visual, has such a strong aesthetic, but it's also like very easy to, as you said, move the show around to, to sort of pick up and pop in and, and do, and do this work. So I wonder if you can speak sort of prior to ART, um, a lot of the work that you were doing and touring the show, um, within Nigeria and, and also the street storms. Um, if you can talk a little bit about that sort of in the beginnings, um, and then I'm gonna take us in a little more to the tour itself, but. Sure, um, yes, we were, we were um, showing in, in Lagos and Abuja successfully. We were selling out the show. And then um, 
um, I had decided that it might be a good idea to, because going to places like theaters was not something that everybody could see. And I wasn't ready to share here word on television or film yet. I'm still mm -hmm. looking for to do that um, film. So what, um, so what I decided was we could package it like it was already ready. So to take it to marketplaces, to university campuses, and then that actually snowballed into um, some organizations, uh, you know, paying or supporting to have it go to really marginalized neighborhoods. Wale mm. um, um, had once, you know, organized with Lagos at 50 for us to go to a big bus stop, a very busy bus stop. And the way that I, that I did that um, is to put speakers, because when they do political rallies here or parties, you put the speakers on the back of a pickup truck. Ah. So I put the speakers on the back of the pickup truck and then wired the, the women, because some of them, again, are celebrities, so we could be in 20 minutes, like, surrounded by, um, because they are film stars. So, and then they would come in a separate air-conditioned bus already made up, jump down, and do, like, a 25-minute, 30-minute um, mm. thing. And this crowd just spontaneously forms, and then everybody starts, as it starts, the tension starts building, <laughs> and they jump on the bus and move to another location. Yeah. But it's funny how the songs and the drumming and the, the you know, because it's so indigenous to this area as well, people in the crowd start singing along as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, we have this clip that I, I, I want to go into, because I think... Um, I love this. I'm glad you sent it um, the, for the film, the trailer for the film. Um, but I think like really captures that. And I know we talked about this yesterday, but I kind of want to play the whole thing. That's okay. It's only two minutes. But two minutes. I, think it, it, <laughs> I think it like really... Uh, it, some context is that we, we were engaged to do this, to mount here word in a, in a, in a marginalized um, uh, you know, town uh, in Lagos. They, I don't want to use slum, but it's 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 on water. It's they're popular popularly known sort of worldwide as Makoko because it's so interesting. But was to use Makoko women who who are sort of like fishing uh, people who sold in the market and Makoko girls who'd never performed before. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's watch this. All right. Here we go. You can be afraid to talk about it. To talk about it. But if you don't start, nobody will start. We will make women's life better for this community. As it goes to do, enough is enough. Step up, stand up. Wake up! Accept nothing less. It is time for a change. The project I'm working on, the women, is a women in Bangui project. It's simply called Here Word. And we're now making the Makoko version of it. That's the whole point of the show, right? <laughs> we're going to be joined today by the ladies from Makoko. We have two students, two teenagers, and then the rest are women and children. Is anybody afraid? So now is a little bit afraid. Okay, say it. No good in Pabidi. No good in Adudo. Now that. No good in Pabidi. No good in Adudo. The program is to use theater to make women more um, aware. Right? Men always said women are nothing. But I know that we have the power to move. <laughs> amazing yeah so it's so incredible. i have to mention chris chris van der Boom is a is a dutch um 
filmmaker, um, philanthropist and business person who I ran into by chance in Lagos. And, you know, uh, it turned, it's, it's an incredible film, but I gave him such a hard time. I really didn't want, um, it didn't feel comfortable having, um, signing up for this, but now I see that <laughs> that <he's, laughs> his persistence. It took him a year and a half for him to convince me to allow him to film behind us. I was like, "What? You know, this is weird." Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> it no, worked. You know, so, you know, sorry, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I, it, this clip is so incredible, in particular in this moment because we're all sitting here during this pandemic thinking like, okay, what is our responsibility as theater makers? What are we supposed to focus on? What stories are we supposed to tell? And if we can't do that in our building, where should we be doing it? And like trying to break out of this idea that like the theater has to happen in this building, in this space, in this time. But actually the act of storytelling can be anywhere. And it's more important about the story you're telling than all the other things that surround it. And this is so reaffirming, I think, in that moment and it's so like central to the work you've done yeah it's 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 amazing what's happening i mean people are streaming uh theater now you know Le Miserable. people are watching Le Miserable here in lagos i mean i thought that was just incredible where you know you might have thought oh it would be my desire one day to travel abroad get through the whole visa problem and and get to new york city to watch um phantom of the opera or something and people were tuning in it's just fantastic yeah it's great yeah. um so the other big thing and you know this is where we've been so um fortunate to be involved because um here where it has had this sort of incredible national tour um You've been to Harvard twice. Um, we did sort of that special weekend presentation at the uh, Harvard Dance Center. And then as part of the ART season a year later, um, where we ran for three or four weeks. Um, and then this past winter, you know, we were on tour at the Under the Radar Festival at the Public Theater, um, the Sigerstrom Center in Costa Mesa, California, um, back to New York for a performance at the Africa Center, um, and then to Germany, right? To Hamburg? Germany. Italia in Germany. Hamburg. Yeah. And you've also been to Amsterdam. Mm hmm So now it, different different cities within Nigeria too. So it's almost like we did only two, then went, and then now we're moving around. And and Ghana. Yes. Um and then, of course, there was, you know, we, we also got to bring um, a group from ART as part of our ART travel um, series to Edinburgh um, mm -hmm. to see the show um, in the Edinburgh Festival, which was, which was really uh, sort of an incredible experience. So, um, and the UN. <laughs> Far be it for me to leave the United Nations out of the equation. So, and, you know, I've had the good fortune of being on most of those stops with you. And I think a lot just about, how the show shifts and changes um, depending on the audience that's seeing it as well and what the actors go through and like gauging what the reaction from an audience might be. Um, and so I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how you've experienced different responses from audiences, both in the moment that they're watching the show, but also how folks talk about it after seeing it. Yes. Um well, let me first talk quickly about the actresses. There's always a little bit of a struggle with the actresses to take the um, pigeon out, mm. uh, to, to remove a little bit more of the pigeon. We always leave some, but even the accents to say, you know, because of course, they, you know, in Nigeria, that all the subtext is so easily understood with like emphasis in accent. So, which might be read differently abroad. So there's always that, but they get there and we get there and it works. Um, in, so yes, yeah, so we tone down the accent a little bit and we, um, we remove some of the heavier language. Now, we also, when there's a whole Yoruba song is projected on the back wall. Right. And in Germany, they translated the entire play and it just bled nicely. I mean, it was so beautifully done by Talia Theater where all the words were just kind of like summarized and put on the back wall. So it wasn't like this side thing running. It was like part of the scene. I thought that was so beautifully done. And, um, and of course, 
the audience behaves very differently and you have to kind of tell the actresses that like in Germany, nobody said anything, nobody, they barely clapped through the whole thing, right? They were just like silent. And then at the end, there was this huge 1000 seater standing ovation and oh my God. four curtain calls. They just kept clapping. I would leave and they'd be still clapping. We came back, we played another song. So it's like, I said to them, you see, it's not like, cause they get exhausted cause they're used to the Nigerian audience. Nigerian, just like in movies, they want to talk to the screen. So in Nigeria, your people are responding immediately to, to the to the actresses, especially on the university campus with this uh, Unilag, we did 1,300 seats at Unilag. And they are screened, you know, the play that's 90 minutes took like, you know, another 15 minutes right. because <laughs> the audience gets up in between the scenes and dances and screams and then goes back down and settles back down again. Next, you know, it's almost like, yeah. so it's very, it's, it's very different, yeah. But it's also, uh, you know, um, the the stories are these interviews you've done with Nigerian women, but the themes of the of the play really transcend culture in that way. Because to your point, like the patriarchy is real in many cultures, and so I feel like that's always been the other piece, at least seen from our audiences, the ways in which people identify with the stories or understand the stories, um, regardless of cultural competence. Absolutely. I mean, it's, there's a universal story across all, um, all of it. I mean, it manifests in its very different ways um, and in its same ways, in its similar ways. Even at the ART, um, you had audience members who were overwhelmed by the piece a little bit that, you know, said it was just really afterwards I was painful to watch. And it's painful to watch because you're having a catharsis or you're reliving some experience that you have, you know, or there's so much empathy which comes from um, experience. Um, but, you know, American Rep, the Lobo was nice enough to have, I thought it was a great idea that they had a separate room, that it was sort of streaming and you could choose to watch it privately in that room if you felt like it was just too much. Um, on the tough bits, of course, they had the humorous and sexy bits and everything, but you know, it runs the gamut. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, I, we um, have been in so many places with the show and I, I can feel sort of the way it affects um, the visibility of and sort of activism around women's rights um, that I think is, again, not exclusive to Nigeria. And so I wonder if you can tie sort of the political effects that you've seen the play have both in the way that maybe politicians have engaged with the play, but, you know, being invited to the UN to perform at the General Assembly, which was incredible. Um, but also just other ways in which the, the street storms, the, the platforms in which the play has been offered have affected activism or, or affected um, sort of issues around women's rights globally. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, um, you know, I didn't design the play thinking that it was going to have this type of, I mean, I was surprised at the effect the play had because I thought, oh, we're going to do this thing for, you know, a year or something, a year or two or a season, and then it'd be done. But it's still going six and a half years later. Um, people come into the, after the show, there's this spontaneous talk back because we originally didn't have talk backs. We, this happened because the audience themselves started talking back in the lobby. And then I found out, you know, when I heard somebody say, oh, this is my fifth time seeing the show. And somebody would say, fifth, this is my ninth time seeing the show. And then I realized that while I was counting heads and tickets, people were coming back more times. So it's like you're counting the same person nine times. Um, you know, when we reached like 50,000 audience members, I was like, okay, you know, how is this happening? I think what's happening is that people have found a safe space where for 19 minutes they can deal with issues in the dark and they can watch it like it's really happening because the performance is done in a way where it's real. You know, the actors are really feeling it. And so they can have their own little therapy session. Like I always make a joke in Cambridge that um, in Cambridge it's cool to announce that you have a therapist, you know, I'm going to go see right after lunch, I'm gonna see my therapist. But here it's like a big shameful thing 
to have a therapist. And there are there many therapists or counselors around. So it gives you that self thing. Um, also politically, we've had um, we've been we've been fortunate, I think, to have so many um, women commissioner of women's health, governor's wives, thirty six governor's wives, the wife of the vice president, the wife of the president, um, the wife of the governor in New York. The, you know, that type of thing, you know, the Secretary General of the UN. These people have come um, to the show and come, stayed afterwards and talked about it and invited the show places um, and also used the show as a sort of platform for to parallel work that they may be doing. Mm -hmm. uh, recently, we've seen a crop of other um, feminist work in Nigeria that... Um, that has a very similar structure to hear word, you know, no set and that kind of thing um, working. So there are many, many um, feminist plays coming up. I, this last year we had about four new, really good popular plays uh, come up. So I think there is just even a movement. And while the issues in America may be like, okay, you know, equal pay, rape, you know, child molestation, those type of heavy issues and the lighter issues like talking about um, women around a water fountain. What does it mean? And, you know, people are experiencing that now with COVID. They're not like, you know, the white noise in the office, the, the little, because I think people, don't, we don't realize how spiritual we are, that if you sit around and gossip about another woman that's moving high up, you carry that weight, even if you aren't the other woman. Yeah. So your spirit knows not to be too adventurous or too, to move too high up the ladder because you are part of putting someone down who did. And you're right? seeing what happened to that woman who did. You yeah. see what happened to that woman. At the same time, the woman who is going up the ladder feels the sense of your lack of support. I mean, there's so many little things in the play, but in the Nigerian um, world, not having a child... It's a huge, huge burden on a woman. Mm -hmm. It's so, it's so, and it doesn't matter how educated she is. It's such a painful thing, not being, not being able to be married. You know, there are sayings in the language like, you know, my children need like uh, a, the, the, the head and the pole to tether themselves to their lineage to. You know, it's like a woman who had a child, nobody knows who the father is. It's like the child is not the same level as a child who everyone knows who the father is. I mean, there are all these different things in language that are missing. And you can't, you know, even as a director, I had to give up like a lot as the play became international. Like, how do you explain, um, you know, a phrase in pidgin? She, she needs, my daughter-in-law must learn how to come out eye from something, to shift her gaze from what she desires from her aspiration, she should shift her gaze so she can face the home, face the children, and most importantly, serve the husband. How do you explain, you go learn how you go, come out I for something. You can't say it in English, you say, okay, she has to learn how to be content or not to aspire. I mean, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I went yeah. off that, but that's, that's just how my head <laughs> I, I, You know, this point about like, the subtlety in our culture sometimes when we are able to convene and the ways that people can hold that baggage is, is really well taken in this moment. Um, I wonder how, what kind of political challenges you face trying to make the play? Have there been times that people have just completely stood in the way of a production or tried to shut you down or? Um, well, we won't, I won't take the group to parts of Nigeria where I know I don't have that much courage to say, oh, I'm going to go way into the northern part of Nigeria or into Boko Haram territory or into areas where I know that, you know, we will be in danger. Um, even being on a university campus, uh, when, when we first started doing this, I, I realized that if I didn't even control the university environment, because they have gangs and cults in mm -hmm. universities. And I remember once on the rape, during the rape scene, we had a group of guys like kind of like barking and mm. um, cheering on the rape um, and saying, you know, eventually she will like it. Ugh. So I had to like myself with some other people head there and grab people by the collar and say, 
if you don't shut up, we walk you outside and we have a special room for you people, you know, and because the, the women on the other hand were all around the place were screaming, shut up, or turn, you know, the actor has to hold, I mean. Hold all that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so it's been like that. So I wouldn't take them to that. We've been able to use the play to talk back to government, actually. So during Chibok Girls, we were able to talk back during the Lagos State Bicycle Shorts Rape where students at the end, the last day, the boys' school next to the girls' school would, the girls would wear two pairs of bicycle shorts and the boys would come with their scissors, you know, whether it was threatening, but, you know, somebody must get raped kind of thing. So we're able to kind of put these in the play immediately, this place for testimony. Um, and as you saw in Makoko, that this, the women who never speak, I mean, in Makoko, women are not even allowed to own any property without permission from a husband. So to have a 13 year old girl stand in front of the whole leadership, what you didn't see is that the entire leadership is there. All the chiefs from all the areas in there are there, the religious leaders, everything. And say, a monologue is, you know, I need you guys to do something about the child molestation happening in this area, you know? And to, 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 to talk to, um, to talk to a leader is, is a big deal in some of these places. Yeah. But yes. Um, I want to get, there's a lot of questions. So I want, I want to get to some of the questions from our viewers, but before we head there, I just sort of zooming out from, from here word. I think the thing, uh, the thing I know from our audiences is everyone wants to know what you're doing next. <laughs> everyone wants to know like, what's the Voma's X project? When are we going to see her again? When is she back in our lives? And so, um, there's there's that question like what are you working on now but i but i also have like a more sort of 30,000 foot view where i just i wonder you know both artistically and otherwise what inspires you what what where do you always feel called as an artist to make work in response to something or about something um what kind of drives you in that way yeah um for me mark it's always been that it just shows up you know i listen I listen to my, my spirit, I listen to intuition. It just keeps showing up. Like it just shows up in my head that you gotta do this, you gotta do that. The thing that's painful for me as an artist is how much, especially in this environment, it takes to make work. Um, <laughs> it's, it's very painful. And the reason I haven't done more work Besides um, Hereward, it's not just that Hereward became successful and I had to follow it because I, I mean, partly because I'm a controlling person, I couldn't kind of hand over. I'm very controlling, you know, Mark. You know. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> the second thing and the more important thing is that there isn't enough support for all artists around the world and more so artists in Nigeria and then artists making political work. work. There's more support if you're making a feel-good piece. It's just like people won't touch religious work, people won't touch social impact work. And it makes sense, a brand, most of the, where we got was brands supporting us. And then places like the American Repertory Theater, someone like Diane Borgia and Diane Paulus, seeing the work and saying, wow, you know, of course I have to mention Carolyn Elkins and Sue Cook, right. who saw the work in Lagos and brought it to Harvard. But that's also the same thing. It got to Amsterdam because somebody saw it in Lagos and said, you know what, I want to take this to Amsterdam. We rely on people to take it, to move it, because I'm a one-person show. Nobody believes that, but I'm doing the communications, I'm doing the letters, I'm doing the this, I'm booking the tickets. Um, you know, it's too much. Now, of course, like I said, I'm controlling but I also, it's, it's hard to find good help here. Everybody complains about it. Um, it's also hard to afford it. Mm, yeah. To afford it. Um, but back to my work. Um, I do have work I wanted to do on LGBTQ. You know that. I, I have work that I wanted, I want to do on tolerance, just tolerance mm. around, you know, tribal, et, et cetera. Um, I want here where to go to film and even even pitching that, even taking the time. And I have four children. So I think I'm just like one of these, like get involved in everything. Cause I'm just like a spontaneous eruption of like Bill. For, Bill. for, for no, those no. of you watching, take note. If you know someone at Netflix <laughs> or HBO, yes, yes, yes. let HBO. us know. HBO, <laughs> Netflix, all of them, Oprah Winfrey, whatever. Um, Reese Witherspoon, you know, we'll take it. 
Um, so here's the thing. So um, because I know the work and all artists who do social impact work know that you have a liberty for, you have a license with the liberty that art gives you. You can say anything to anyone. We've been sitting on stage in front of the president talking about the president of Nigeria and gotten away with it. Now the audience may be mm, as yeah. this, you know, but we've been able to do it, get out of the building. Right, right. <laughs> because it's like, was that a joke? Was that not? Did they really mean it? You know, that kind of thing. And you can, you can do so much with art. So I'm inspired by Nigeria. I'm inspired by Africa. I'm inspired by what women can do to change the world. I'm so inspired. Look at the countries that have women as presidents. I'm so inspired by that. I'm inspired by women collaborating um, to do big work and to change the way the world is. I also love Nigerian culture. When I say I'm inspired by Nigeria, I'm talking about the culture the language, the food, and the people. I'm not talking about the quagmire and the lack of infrastructure and the lack of, you know, whatever. No, but I, separating culture from government is um, really important right now. Uh, <laughs> a lot of Americans are learning that as well. Yes. <laughs> America and Nigeria, we are looking alike. <laughs> yes. We are looking alike. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, we've got some some great questions, and we're just a little over ten minutes left, so I want to dig into some of these here. Um, and some folks have asked just about like the future of your word and whatnot. So I've kind of answered you privately, you know, with my email if we want to connect offline. So um, if I don't get your question, um, just check because I may have answered you um, directly. Um, we have uh, Parmi Polk has some questions here. We've answered. Um, oh, I think we might have answered all of them. I think, pardon me if we didn't let us know, but I think we touched on think, all those pieces. I think the future is the film, but the future is that mm -hmm. two things would be great. To have a proper European tour and to have a proper US American university tour. I mean, there are cities that there are a lot of Africans like Washington DC, Atlanta, Georgia, Houston, Texas. The show yeah. hasn't been to, because like I said, again, you know, if anybody wants to support administratively, I mean, we have offers all the time for, for, um, for uh, volunteers, but volunteers require someone to work with volunteers. And I, I don't have that capacity right now. What I'm doing now is just kind of waiting in a holding pattern, trying to organize, trying to get my structure together, trying to get my children who I sort of abandoned for some, you know, some period of time back on track. And, and get myself, you know, strong again. But I'm, I'm very ready, getting ready to go. You can feel it, Mark. Yeah, you know, I used to be like tired walking around. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm ready for some new work. And I have a lot of new work in my spirit and in my mind. Yeah, um, and it, it's, it's, you know, great that you just brought up Atlanta because Joyce Edwards asks us here. Um, Joyce says she's known, known you for years of FOMA. Um, and that- Thanks, hi uh, Joyce. <laughs> um, loves your work and, and was saying uh, if you're considering bringing it back to America namely Atlanta which Atlanta is a place that we have talked about a lot to your point uh, having a, a great Nigerian community and also a great artistic community yeah what it, what it takes is, is having a theater home you know so it means someone goes to Spelman College to the Alliance um, and says you know I have this show and I want to bring it what does it take and they start that conversation um, or you know, like I said, I have like a business development person who will do that, but I don't have one yet. So we'll get there. It's going to work. Do you have um, other interviews or other stories you've written that have like hit the cutting room floor that would come back in or, or other things that you've thought about, like adding new monologues into here or changing some things out or? Yeah, I mean, I do add um, as a show comes up, there's always something new in every every mono every version of here word has a little tweaking um but yes i would there, there's just work that i would like to do you know about um about equality there's just a lot of work and and i would like here word to get to a point where it does go to film and the reason is that somebody far away in the border of niger and nigeria can watch it the same way they watch football, where you have 30, 40 people watching one TV screen 
Mm -hmm. um, watch Manchester versus, you know, United, then, you know, people can do that with Hear Word. But, but I need to get to where I can make it like that. I, I need to get the funding and the people interested in doing it the proper way. Right. So we'll, we'll get there. It's going to happen. Yeah. Um, Sarah Samir writes, um, as a woman from the U.S., what's the most effective way to support women's rights in Nigeria? I think it's to support women, even if it's just supporting one woman. Um, it, it's it's. It's a hard toll, like today I just saw a woman who, there was some story on, of a woman who has eight children and her husband died and you know, she couldn't, in this COVID period, she couldn't feed the children, so she's late in the night, like boiling um, you know, stones and leaves, so the women, the children feel a sense of something is going to be cooked. I mean, that's like an extreme story, but you, know, you see that when you're caught up, and it's on every, Every level, when you're caught up trying to balance home, um, relationship, um, et cetera, and you're also not in an environment where women feel a sense of collaboration because there's so much fear around losing your spouse. That's, that's really one of the things that drove me. I just looked at the environment. I was like, oh my goodness, women spend so much time worrying about losing their husbands. You know, single women are looking at married women thinking that this is the life, you know, I just don't have this yet. I'm not Mrs. So my life hasn't started. My life will begin when I become Mrs. And then married women are looking at the single women like, you're like the fox in the hen house here. Mm -hmm. You're showing up in this environment. And you know, energy, energy is, you know, energy goes around. You gotta like get the, you gotta use that energy and harness it. And then it's exponential. And I think Evensla, who I haven't mentioned, Evensla gets that also in, you know, how do you bring women together to make them work together and to, to relax the mind and to, to, to go away from worry that may not actually change anything for you. It may not change anything for you because you could spend so much time worrying. In my own personal life, I never learned to trust and collaborate with other women. I didn't. And it wasn't about protecting my boyfriend. It was just that I didn't grow up in, in, an, in, a, in a home or in a, in a space where that was something that was embraced, that this sisterhood business. You know, I have two sisters that I'm very close to, but this sisterhood thing wasn't... And so when I would look at women who had like a sisterhood, it's just like, what is that? You know, what is this thing? You know, now I belong to this sisterhood. And wow, if anything happens to me, my those women, they are coming for whoever it is that's touching me. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, there's kind of a perfect segue here into a, a question from um, Anne Plaisance. Uh, she says she's working on an international empowerment art project uh, about domestic violence right now. What do you think is an effective strategy to involve men successfully as a part of the conversation in these issues? I think that... Um, the only thing I can do is, I think it's, it's important to involve men, but not on a superficial level. I think if men are, I've found that men hang around in the lobbies after hear word and talk, mm -hmm. and they want, to, they want to understand how they can help. They also sometimes want to feel less guilty. And as you could see with what I was explaining, sometimes there are men in the audience who are perpetrators. This happens every show I am aware that we have in the room with us. There's gonna be at least one rapist, maybe some child molesters, you know, whatever it is, they're gonna be in that space. Mm. Um, I don't know yet, we're starting to collect testimony now. I don't yet know what it does. I, but I do think art is a powerful tool for people to revisit something and say, you know what, that was an error or the other way around as a victim. Um, I need to let this go. This is how this is affecting my life. 
I think men, what we had for here word, and I don't know, this is my only, my own thing was we started having men buying bulk tickets. I had a man buy a hundred tickets. Um, you had even some man buy 150 or 200 tickets for, uh, for, for second, for high school students. We had men buy for the whole office. And then we started seeing like fathers come with their daughters and, and women come with their fiancés and that type of thing. So I think that there's something about being immersed in the art that allows you to bring something that has been hidden out and maybe make a correction. But on a broad scale, if you're talking globally, um, it's hard for men to understand because it's a culture you grow up with. So what, you, what, what men can understand is if you are in a home that you see a certain thing happen, you're likely to expect that when you also grow up. And a lot of men, when we've done focus groups, I said, you know, I got married and I thought when I got married, all my problems would be solved because somebody would bring me an iron shirt, somebody would have my cooked meal. And I got married to this like modern Nigerian woman and boom, there's no meal at six o'clock or seven o'clock when I come home. Nobody's taking my briefcase from me at the door. You know, like they took my father's briefcase at the door and they had the meal, you know, and they're like, everything has changed, you know. So, but it's all, it's all fun. I think the world is shifting. What can you do? Get men involved. You're wearing the Hear What T-shirt, Mark, you know. Yeah, this, this man's involved. Um, <laughs> um, we have a, a great question here from uh, Pamela Napalma. And Pamela says, um, excellent work, Mrs. Fafunwa. I've seen the play twice at Harvard. I was curious as to whether there are more stories in your work that highlight positive relationships with men and other women or a more positive female experience in Nigeria outside of abuse, limiting expectations, et cetera. Um, and then she followed up that it was kind of related to the point you were making about sisterhood, which is very true of the play. I feel like the, the, the play has as much comedy and levity as it does drama. Yes, I mean, the play has a clear trajectory. It shows sort of the light things that women themselves do that don't encourage equality. You know, gossiping, uh, moms expecting daughters to have, you know, grandchildren now and at their timing, all this pressure. Um, just even little things like touching or women denying another woman, which is still happening. You know, um, examples, for instance, even when I always draw the American example, you know, you watch a video, you watch a music video and one man has like six half naked women, you know, on either side. Well, they, you can draw parallels to everything. You know, it's just like the man who, you know, in the play has his wife come in, he, a, a businessman come in, he says the wife should sleep with the some people say, oh, that's so weird. Well, you know, somebody can say, hey, honey, put on that short black dress because we're going to see the such and such. And I want to make sure, you know, he takes the deal, right? So it's still the same thing. You can yeah. always draw parallels. But, but yeah, so I, I think that um, if you really look at the play, it starts out with the light things, then it goes to heavier things. You can't not show the heavy things. And then it goes to sisterhood. And it goes to women who stand up against the, the, the system, stand up against the abuse, and stand up against, to, against other women as well. And then the end of the play is the sisterhood. Yeah, that, that's what I love about Community Fails, um, because I do think it, like, it summarizes the piece in such a beautiful way, and seeing those women give testimony and, and really having us bear witness to that story and, and sort of cap that in that way is really incredible. Um, Debbie O'Heary wrote in and just said, wow, beautiful memories of Makoko, the floating community. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Debbie. <laughs> Debbie's like a powerful, powerful voice in, um, in here. Where she's, she's our chanter and, you know, boom, she never needs a microphone. That's true. That is true. She fills a room. It's beautiful. Um, SD wrote, I think we covered some of this, um, in terms of making continue the play or, or adding new stories, which we talked about. Um, they also say, is Hear Word uh, a live theater available for purchase on your website at ART? Well, not at the moment. <laughs> um, I think particularly because there's, we have such like TV film aspirations, right? Like that's what we want. Yeah, exactly. And of course, for um, Mark, also it's been um, translated into French. So, wow. um, and the UN had had a conversation about Arabic. And so, so what will happen is we've got to figure a way, you know, even somebody had said, you know, want to make it a book and 
that type of thing. We got to figure a way to um, to share it broader, to scale up, um, and and to to make it available. Definitely. I mean, I think that's next step um, for for Hear Word. That's. I mean, that's what's always struck me is it's it's never felt like the end of the road for Hear Word. It, it, it's it's so present. It's so topical. There are always so many other ways, and there are so many other people who need to witness it as a piece. Yes. And we've started showing Hear Word. We did um, boys secondary schools. So we started showing Hear Word for boys secondary schools, boys high schools. And then we've also done, done a dumbed down version um, with the lighter issues for, um, for what do you call middle school. Mm. So, so yeah, so it's, um, it's moving. Um, it's believe it or not, 101 or 601 um, in Legos. Um, I, Afoma, I'm so I'm so happy we did this today. It's it was such such an incredible conversation. And like I said, it, for me to continue to talk about this piece because there is still so many people who have not got to experience it and would would benefit so greatly from experiencing it. I think um, it's it's worth constant conversation. I think it will it will live on for quite some time. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm so glad you reached out, and um, I love it. This lunch with Lunsford. Yeah, you know, or, 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 or dinner with Lunsford, I guess, if you're... If you're dinner with Lunsford, yeah. dinner's about to start, yeah. So um, um, but thank you for all the people who tuned in as well. Um, you know, look out again where, you know, you can, we kind of post stuff, I don't want to be badging, but at here what Naija um, or at Ifoma Fafunwa, um, and we will post where we're going uh, from time to time, you know. So yeah, let's we'll see... We'll put the website and some of the social handles and the, the sort of post show email so folks can have that. I think that'd be great so folks can follow and keep track. Um, yeah, just to echo Foma, thank you all for watching. Um, next week we have um, Diana O oh joining us to talk about her piece Clairvoyance um, from last season. Um, I will say there's a bit of homework for, for you reliable viewers. Um, there's a nine minute video recap of Diana's work, which we are not gonna show next week because I don't think anyone wants to watch nine minutes of video on Zoom, but we're going to include the link in the post your email from today. So if you get a chance the next week to check that out, it's a, it's a great video, um, very moves, moves quickly and gives you a really great sense of Diana and her work from, from last season. So thanks everyone again. Thank you, Afoma. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everyone.